Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. Sells. All right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. On the show with us today, we actually have a couple people in the studio, which is nice change. John Adams is joining us. John and I actually produce another podcast called Two Dudes Talk Money and Music. And he's actually joining us in the studio today. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. And with us today, special guest that John set up. Uh, These guys are buddies. He is in Nashville, Tennessee. His name is Trey Bruce. For those of you that don't know about Trey, let me give you a little introduction. He moved to Nashville about 1990 or thereabouts from Memphis became, uh, I should say, luckily as an unpublished songwriter, got his first demo cut almost immediately for Shelby Lynn, which wound up being a top 15 hit, went on to record some other cuts, including a number one hit for Randy Travis called Look Heart, No Hands. After three years at MCA, he co-founded a small indie publishing company called Big Tractor Music with renowned record producer Scott Hendricks. And Trey received 13 ASCAP awards, an Emmy, five number one singles, multiple top five and top ten radio hits, and an ACM Music Song of the Year nomination. That's who's in the studio with us today. Trey, welcome to the show. Hey, Bob. Good to be here. So we're going to talk about something that we kind of play with on other episodes, but you're the expert on this from what we're hearing, and that is the purchasing or the acquisition of song catalogs. And we were talking for a moment before the show. There's a whole lot of different subgenres that go along with that. But the question, and we've asked entertainment lawyers, we've asked other publishers, songwriters, what is the motivation that's driving these artists selling their catalogs? Well, I'm not an expert, but I know a little bit about it. Also good to see, John. Well, people sell houses for all kinds of reasons, even when it's a good time or not, depending on their, their needs. The big catalog sales like Springsteen and Stevie Nicks, Bob Dylan, ZZ Top, Ryan Tedder, people like that, They don't sell because they need the money necessarily. They've just, well, there's fear of higher taxes in the future. So that's one reason to sell now. And they, a lot of times, just like with any relationship, you need a new honeymoon. And the people that represent your catalog for X number of years, it's time to change. And, you know, in the twilight of your career, not over, but it, towards the end, you may decide just to cash in and own your earnings with a nice multiple that's negotiable and start a new catalog or do something different or maybe even retire. Does there seem to be a newfound interest from the buyers of these catalogs? That's part A of the question. And part B is who are these buyers that are, are paying out these massive sums of money for these libraries that these artists have? Right. Well, we call them catalogs, and there's the usual suspects like Universal, Sony, Warners, BMG, but there's some that most people haven't heard of, people that aren't in the music business, like Primary Wave and Round Hill Music and um, several just groups of hedge funds that come up with a publishing entity and they buy them for investments. And some groups of investors may want to buy a catalog and just sit it in the basement and let it graze out its time. And they'll buy catalog after catalog after catalog, not $300 million catalogs, mind you, but 10 million, 20 million, 5 million, and just 
load up on them and just let them graze out their time. And different catalogs will go up and down at different times and just let them do what they do. There's a natural tail, but if you buy catalogs with something in it close to a standard or a classic, then those things pop up periodically. Every 10, 15 years, you'll get a big use out of one of those. As opposed to the investor or publishing company that wants to nurture that catalog going forward, which means not just let it graze in the field, but find other songs in the catalog that should have been big songs by now and go rework those songs to get current uses. And sometimes, depending on how old the catalog is, you might want to redemo. You might want to repurpose some of the old hits as new masters with different, totally different color and then get new uses. So there's buying a catalog to invest and there's buying a catalog to invest and put money into uh, shepherding that catalog into the future. The value we've seen of these different catalogs, these monetary amounts, what are those based off of? Is it based off the depth of hits that are attached to it, or is it based on the entire catalog library that's in there? How are they coming up with these prices uh, of you know offering someone a hundred hundred and fifty two hundred million dollars or even what you mentioned on the smaller scale five ten fifteen twenty million well it's a multiple it's if a catalog sells for ten thousand dollars, just keeping it easy and are they valued at 10 and the writer wants 30,000? Well, that sold for a multiple of three. However, there hasn't been anything sell for three by and large in a long time. I mean, 30s have been heard of in the last three years. 20s, we didn't even dream of 20s for a long time, and 20s happen all the time. 18, 15 multiples. I was looking at a catalog eight years ago, it was a big catalog. And um, the uh, artist-songwriter had gotten into some kind of trouble, Ponzi scheme or something, not hers, but someone else's. But anyway, she was down some money and decided to move this catalog. And it was a great catalog. And she was moving it for like a four or five multiple, which would be a steal. Um, and now you can't, can't even think about a catalog like that for under a 12 or 13. I read... Uh, a few months ago, Al Jackson was uh, Al Green's drummer, a lot of Stax musicians' drummers. And Al, I'm not sure what year, but he was killed in his driveway, uh, shot back in the 70s. I'm sure it was a long time ago. And um, his family just sold his portion of some of those songs for a 20 multiple. And that's been in the last 24 months. And he's been gone a long time. But that's Al Green songs. What about copyright issues? The ownership of the copyright of the song. And, and of course, once again, we're talking about the person that owns the song that's selling it, and they have the copyright. So the person who now purchases it, that investment, who does the copyright continue to stay with until it runs out of its life, which I guess is, what, 60 years or so after the person's passing? When you say song, there's the record, which is, the, is a song, and right. then there's the publishing which is also a song. Publishing, if you and I write a song and we sell it to an investor for $100, we sell the publishing, then you get half of that and I get half of that. And each of our halves are split in half because if a dollar is made on a song, 50% of that is publishing and the other 50% is the writer's share. So a writer could conceivably... Um, just sell their writer's share and not bother selling their publishing and just sell their writer's share, which is the income stream that comes in every quarter, and keep the publishing. Uh, lots of people have done that. And then hold on to the publishing for another 20 years and then sell it. Or you could sell the mechanical share, which, of course, now wouldn't be worth much because there are no sales, basically. But the copyright and then the sound recording, which is the master, he who pays for the recording owns the master, and uh, so the sound recording has a copyright as well. But songwriters and artists don't necessarily control that piece. Uh, when they do, they can sell it as well, but usually that's tied up at least with one record label owning a good bit of it. But the copyright follows who owns the copyright. If you purchase it, 
it follows you until you sell it to someone down the line. And the heirs get it for life plus 70. Life plus 70, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before it becomes public domain. And then you have a writer who it may be his first cut or two, and he hits one out of the park, big number one record. Let's say it's a country song on Nashville on country radio. He, it's not a good time to sell, but everybody has personal things. It may be a life of no, no money or bad money spent leads you with all of a sudden you have this big money coming in every three months and you go, well, I'm going to sell. And so he sells, basically, this person sells before the majority of the money has even hit the mailbox. So he's not going to get the best deal, but he's going to get a deal based on what he needs to put in the bank right now with whatever the interest rates are that he has at his disposal. And a lot of times for the buyer, that's a buyer that just wants a quick influx of cash. They need something that's going to run 18 to 48 months before the tail, because a lot of songs that are on the radio aren't standards, which means they're not getting cut again. I mean, you can imagine if you listen to country radio right now or any radio, but that's we're in Nashville, so I'm picking on that one. How many of those songs are you going to hear in five years, 10 years, 55 years from now, cut by someone else? So the publisher has to look at that as a there's a quick money coming in for the next five years on this song. Let's buy it and look for the second song. Look for the next hit. The way to value a catalog is go, let's see. Steve wrote these two big hits. They're coming in. There's 300 songs in the catalog. Let's see who else he wrote songs with in that catalog. Oh, well, he's got about 20 other big co-writers who are their publishers. So you're reading it like a stock. You say you've got 300 songs. 50 of them are written by 20 co-writers that are all at other big publishers. Um, So you go, is this guy going up or down in his career? So you read all of that stuff, and that stuff comes in above or below whatever the multiple asking price is. It's literally kicking tires and going, well, we just put a new transmission in this six months ago, so we're looking up, up the price a little bit. It's just like that, actually. And then they'll go, well, we're not worried about that. We're going to take it apart and sell it for parts anyway. So, I mean, anything is possible with one sale of one catalog. In the studio with us today, Trey Bruce is joining us along with John Adams. Hi, this is Nancy Deccan with Discover Sooner. Check out my episode coming up with Bob Bender's The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics. All written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler and I approve of this message. Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us and it affects our everyday lives. Whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Mindy Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at music's benefits through the lens of science and medicine, entertainment, and business. You can find me and Enhanced Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. You're listening to the business side of music. Question for the people that are buying these catalogs. Is it investors that aren't in the music business? Is it record companies? Is it other publishers? 
who who are the people that you know of that are buying these catalogs up these days? Well, big publishers are buying them, and we know that. And then middle-sized publishers are buying them. And there are some publishers that you ne- you just don't hear of. The regular pedestrian doesn't know these names that are competing with the big publishers on big catalogs like uh, Hypnosis, a really great company run by some real uh, leaders, and they're spending a lot of money. Roundhill does the same. I think some companies may actually um, pay 10 when they know they should be paying 9 because they want that catalog or they want that brand name of that artist associated with their catalog. So it's another worm in the water when they're going to court another catalog. Well, you know, we have so-and-sos. So there's those guys. And then there's a lot of just hedge funds, investment funds. If you were a catalog, a publisher that was getting into the acquisitions game, there are banks that will loan up to 50% of the asking price. And it's common now. It wasn't 10 years ago. But everybody's in it because it's not as esoteric and strange as you think. It's like it's like a gas and oil stock. Is that something that banks would have even considered a few years back? Well, no. I mean, banks would consider it, but it wouldn't be up to the point where they're just they're loaning 50 percent to get involved because it is much of a normal business as this is when you get to the paper part. It's looked on as wild and songwriters are crazy and we don't know a tax shelter from a phone booth. And, you know, so it's got a lot of misconceptions about it. But when it comes to just what does the money do coming in, going out, it's a really good business model. And if you buy a catalog and compare it to 10 square miles of Oklahoma, you go, well, let's see. This catalog's got about 200 songs in it. It's not worth much, but it but it has promise because of these things. Well, one of those songs goes number one, just like a 10 square miles of Oklahoma. It's got holes in it, drilling for oil. It's worthless until one hits. Well, then it makes all the other holes suspect, like all the other songs in the catalog. Well, if this one's a hit, there's got to be another one. And that is always true. There does have to be another one. We talk about the amount of money that these people such as Stevie Nicks, Neil Young. Springsteen, Neil Diamond, I wrote Dire Straits. Uh, John Lennon I read somewhere. Everybody. Yeah. The Killers, it said, sold. John, I want to ask you this question, and and Trey, you can chime in too, is they make all this money, and of course, like you said, they're they're getting in their twilight years of their career, and you know they want to cash out and either enjoy what they have or have it go on down to their kids or their grandkids. What are the financial ramifications of this? When it comes to tax uh, ramifications or tax in general, I think it's always a good idea for someone to consult their tax advisor, their CPA, or, or a tax attorney, and special, especially on something like this, because this is very, very complicated, in my opinion. Where I see the sell of these catalogs, I think, is where an artist was is most likely trying to generate some type of legacy or generational wealth for his family, because when you're talking about several hundred million dollars, you're talking about financial security for generation after generation of your family. Is that a fair statement, Trey? Or? At the very least, I mean, uh, you can imagine that there's a family whose the grandfather has passed on and he left this catalog. Well, no one knows what to do with it. And so, but you could hire a song plugger. You don't have to sell the publishing company. You could hire someone that's an expert at mining diamonds out of a catalog and create more wealth. It provides an income as it sits, but, I mean, everybody's looking for a classic. There was, my family has a standard in it um, called Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys, and that song's 50-something years old. It's been used over and over and over but one of its biggest uses was only about seven years ago, and that was Volkswagen. And they paid a lot of money to use that song for a Volkswagen ad. And then there's another, t- it's running on a TV show right now, Ashton Kutcher's show on, on uh, cable. So those, that's the kind of song that's it's perennial, it's always coming back. So you want to find a catalog that's got a couple of those kinds of things in it, because those are safe bets. 
but you can uh, mine the catalog for more work. There's repurposed work, which is you take a standard song and you cut it in a different key, different gender, different groove, change the time signature, where almost it's, it's almost unidentifiable until you're sitting there watching Grey's Anatomy and the second 30 seconds of that song, you're going, what in the world is that? That's so familiar. And you shazam it, and it's a police song, you know, from the 80s and 90s. But that, that is now a new master. Whoever owns that master is skiing behind the value of the publishing copyright, which is a whole other business now. So it, you, you can create more value with almost any publishing catalog. There's a hit in almost every catalog. You just have to have the ears and the diligence to find it. Who's the person that finds that? You said song pluggers. Is, is that the norm, or, or who's out there searching for that little kind of, well, you said that diamond that's in the rough? Someone at every publishing company needs to have those ears, and it's not a, something you can quantify any more than Colonel Parker or Sam Phillips saying, that truck driver boy that just left here is a star. Because that guy did that over and over. It was Sam and Dave, Jerry Lee Lewis, Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins, Roy Orbison, Elvis Presley. It just went on and on. Eventually, we know there's not a, a lab or a college that helped that guy develop that talent. He just had it. It was natural instinct. It was just a natural instinct. So you ha need one of those at every publishing company, and you won't get them at that level. You'll just get what you get, and you'll trade later on. Yeah. But you need someone that can hear a song and hear how many people it speaks to, no matter what. Because the song is a yellow sheet of paper with a lyric and a melody. It's not a kick drum. It, it's not hand claps and finger snaps. It's just a lyric and a melody. That's it in its simplest form. It's the DNA. Yeah. You can take the way I, I look at a song is the DNA is the, are the words and the melody. Then you put muscle on it, then you put skin, and then you put clothes. Well, those are the productions. As soon as you put a kick drum on it, production has started, and it's leaning in a direction. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't used to be that way, but now we have, you know, 3,000 kick drum sounds that we all know. Right. So as soon as you start doing that, you're putting clothes and a personality on the song, which is just a piece of DNA. And to be able to hear that and hear a song that was demoed 10 years ago it's dated half the people in the publishing company don't like it aren't going to pitch it but if you go wait a minute guys listen to what he's saying just listen to the lyric i'm going to pass the lyric out to everybody now i'm going to have this guy just play it on acoustic piano well that's a new song i get chill bumps i don't even know what i'm talking about right now i don't know the song but then it's a repurposed it's a new work and you may just hear a qu string quartet and i'll do an upright on it or I mean, you could take Welcome to the Jungle and do that kind of version on it. It would take us five minutes with a player and a singer, and you go, well, there's a whole other use for that. Now I can hear that on blah, 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 blah. You can put that on TV shows, on films, on commercials, Anything. whatever. Anything. So when you buy a catalog because there was two hits and there's 200 more songs in it, it really takes a while. My best idea would be put three interns on it, not because they're free, but because they're young. They're 19 and 21 and 18, and let them look and listen. And just listen, 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 and then start screening what they've screened out with your experience and wisdom, and you're going to find a song in every catalog. In the studio with us today, Trey Bruce, who is the owner and president of Galore Entertainment, which is a sync agency and artist development firm along with John Adams, who is with Money Concepts, and my co-host on Two Dudes Talk Money and Music podcast. Hey, this is Dave Ratner from Creative Law Network. Check out my episode on the business side of music. You're listening to the business side of music. As a musician, you have a dream, that vision of what success looks like for you. Though it's not only about the money, money is part of it. Whether you've been extremely successful or you're just striving to maintain a regular cash flow, you need a plan. Money Concepts can help you develop a customized plan to achieve the financial stability and success you want. 
For over 40 years, Money Concepts has been providing holistic financial planning services to individuals, families, and business owners. As an independent firm, Money Concepts and their associates are committed to always represent the best interest of the client. It's really about a committed, benevolent interest in them personally. This independence coupled with that committed, benevolent interest means they represent you, the client, not a product supplier. It's not about selling products, it's about helping you achieve success. To learn how this can benefit you, contact my buddy, John Adams, with Money Concepts at 737-867-9309. That's 737-867-9309. You can also email John at jadams at moneyconcepts.com. You're listening to the business side of music. Catalogs that have been sold to date, is there one that surprises you more than any other out there for either that you were surprised that the the songwriter sold that catalog or the amount of money that it got or maybe a collection of both? Well, I was a little surprised when the when the rush to sell started happening and I started seeing guys I didn't think would part. Like when Dylan sold his catalog, it may have been colored by all the years of him being so artistic not to let his music represent certain things, but there's obviously a real commercial bone attached to him somewhere because he did sell and he has done some really commercial things back during the Victoria's Secrets promos when Dylan was doing all that stuff. But that one surprised me a little bit uh, not unlike Springsteen, who looks like he set the record for single songwriter sale so far. Not everybody else. I mean, I know artists and songwriter artists, and there's a follow the crowd mentality going on a little bit, just herd mentality. But a lot of people, it's a great time to sell just because it is. And we do have to fear next the next tax season if things go a different way. I mean, Mick Fleetwood sold, then Stevie Nicks sold, now Christy McVie's sold, and they're all selling to different publishers for different amounts of money, and sometimes the so- songs are common with each of those. So that's really interesting. I noticed that Billy Gibbons and ZZ Top got $50 million for the publishing catalog, and about eight years ago, Rush sold, just before the boom, for $50 million, sold the publishing and had they just uh, waited five or six years, th- they would have gotten more. But they didn't. Let's see, I think Dylan's was somewhere in the mil- neighborhood of $400 million for publishing only at Universal. And then a couple years later, here, Sony paid for the masters. So the actual recordings of those songs, and they paid $150 million On top of the 400 On top of the 400 which gets you about where Springsteen is at 550 Wow. For publishing and masters uh, with Sony. We talked about a little bit before the show, too. You have an artist like Jason Aldean, who is not the songwriter, but he's getting involved in this kind of this fervor that's going on now. Explain that a little bit about how maybe his is different than some of the others. Well, everything that I read on that was it was the sound recordings, which is the master, which is the things traditionally the label zone until you're at some point where you're starting to contribute to the record making process the financing of it with the label and that's just that's something new that's you know just happened in nashville in the last 10 to 15 years uh maybe since garth did it before that was partnering in with your masters so if that's if it's true that he just sold masters then it's obviously a perk that he has now since his first record deal and I think he got her in the neighborhood a hundred million for those recordings, those sound recordings, which he's a partner on. And since he he didn't write a whole lot of songs on his records, from what I remember, so the publishing part for him, I haven't heard about it being sold. And if it did, it, it would be smaller because his uh, participation in the songwriting process has never been really big which isn't a bad thing. George Strait's had 50-plus number ones. He didn't write any of them (laughs) and done pretty well. Yeah. The (laughs) songwriters in that equation, let's say with Jason Aldean, do they benefit in some way in in the cell? Well, I would assume whoever gave $100 for that is going to jack up the use of those masters. They're going to try to get those masters used. 
so that would trickle down to the songwriters then. Yes. Hopefully. If it's a mechanical or a performance royalty. Yeah. If it's a sync royalty where they happen to get one of Jason's the actual track used in something that may be with or without the lyric. I would think a lot of times it could be without the lyric because um, there's just not a lot of sync for th those kinds of records that I've noticed. And I will listen and watch this stuff every day. So they have to have a plan. Um, greatest hits packages might not have been out yet. So that's an easy plan. That would affect songwriters from the mechanical side, but since sync is an individual negotiation, not based on consent decrees and government rates, that part doesn't necessarily trickle down to them based on the master. It does based on the publishing and songwriter share. One thing, I think you've probably answered this several times in the last few minutes, but I, I'm not going to say I've struggled to get my head around is why someone would pay that much for a catalog, and it, and you talked about repurposing, is it, you know, for some reason I'm thinking of the California Raisins here. Is it something they think they can put in a commercial later, or like you mentioned, maybe a backdrop in a Grey's Anatomy skit, or maybe repurpose like Greatest Hits albums or something like that? I'm just trying to figure out, obviously it makes sense for somebody to do it because they're doing it, but I just can't quite get my head around I mean, that. there's so much money. And this is about buying the masters. Yeah. The actual recordings that the record label's paid for. You look at the climate, like if you were going to just spend a month doing diligence on film and TV syncs, you would go out there before buying a catalog like that and look at how much uses they get. It's not the lying share of, of syncs for mainstream radio country music. It's, it's not as popular. So you would wonder where they're going to get these reuses. However, country is super hot. You, you can sell football games tailgate parties, trucks, pictures of trucks, pictures of your neighbor's truck. You can sell anything that's country with these kinds of catalogs. Probably easier than you can get a big sink in a major motion picture. Maybe trailers would do better than sometimes just because you'll hear uh, a Guns N' Roses song or b -b 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 bad on trailers all the time and never hear the song in the movie because it's just such a you know, it jerks your head around when you hear Sweet Child of Mine plug in a movie. It'll work in the trailer, but maybe not necessarily fit in the actual I film. I thought about the trailer. Yeah. Enough, yeah. Too. I mean, those are two different uses that garner two different prices. So when you're buying the masters of country records, uh, you have to wonder and do your homework. What What are you going to make that $100 million back off of? Yeah. Because it's hard to make $100 million just selling your records. Yeah, I'm having trouble. These days it is, yeah. As great as Bob Dylan was and still is, you know, he's almost 80 years old if he's not already 80. And you're talking about 19, 20-year-old interns trying to sort through or screen a potential catalog. And somebody out there is a heck of a lot smarter than me if they can turn some of those Dylan classics into something that's marketable oh, now. You, you can. Most of us know a few of his songs, but very few people are you know, have deep knowledge of the catalog. So I... I I'm just trying to figure out. It's a spot in a movie. I mean, you, you can pick a title of Bob's and throw it into a scene, and that scene becomes that song. It can be horses racing across a field, people blowing up an elevator on the 10th floor, and you put a Dylan song behind it, a violent, spooky one, or just one on him and a, gu and a guitar, and that scene changes. It's like Reservoir Dogs where they played Stuck in the Middle with you, I think, when that guy was hacking that other dude's ears off, which was quite gross, actually. Right. So I never actually thought about that, too. You just mentioned it. You could actually have it with a it particular... It changes the I'm, dynamics. I was thinking of soundtracks, and you're I speaking mean, of what individual the director scenes. director thinks yeah. or uh, a, a scene is can drastically change in the screening room when you're starting to drop different music backgrounds behind it, and you'll go, I never expected to feel this because of the song in the background. It's powerful. It's like the Amazon TV series Bosch. That right. that that music, a jazz. lot of and I mean old standard jazz like Art Pepper that you maybe never heard of or hadn't thought of in forty or fifty years, and it just set the tone for the scene. I remember the pop song movie with all the animals animated. Sing was full of massive classics. I mean Beatles, Bowie, everybody. And there's um, 
a character that's a pig or a hippo or an elephant or something, and she's got her grocery cart, and she's swishing down the aisle, and there's a, a Latino track playing behind it. And I wasn't familiar with who it was, but I saw that catalog of masters go across a desk about two years ago for sale. Well, that song gets used all the time. I mean, it was a big sale for this catalog, and it was, I can't think of the name of the band. It's um, its all older gentlemen at this point, 60s and 70s. Yeah. And it's an instrumental you've heard a million times. So, again, if you own a master, you can also go in and take Bob's voice off of it and put someone else's voice on it and use that master. That means you can also take instruments off the master and put new ones on it because you own it. You don't have to use it just as the master. Well, I think you answered. I should have phrased my question like Denzel Washington did in Philadelphia. If you only remember the scene at first, he started to explain this to me like I'm a sixth grader. And by the end of the trial, he was explaining it to me like I'm a first grader. And I think that's what you did. And that's why I needed to hear it, frankly, because <laughs> I never thought about the individual scene part. of it. Yeah. I was thinking soundtracks. Dude, yeah. I for know some publishers reason. that left to their own devices in a dark room with a gun to their head. They can't explain <laughs> publishing sometimes because it's tricky. It's like if you ask me about NFTs, I would say... I'm positive I've read all about it, and I can't tell you how it works. Three letters in the alphabet. Yeah, it, it's still a mystery. That makes at least two of us in this room. <laughs> so. What are you up to these days? What's next for you? Uh, I retooled right at the top of COVID, uh, getting ready just to stay home and not leave much. So um, I started looking for film and TV artists all over the world, and found more than I have time to deal with, but I found some good ones. And um, I've been writing with them steadily, one in Poland, one in Toronto, one in Orange County, one in London, and just writing songs that they like for themselves, but it just happens to fit wide casts for film and TV. It's, we're not driven to write for TV. We're doing what these artists honestly do. and. It happens to be good stuff for those. You're who, finding homes for them. Yes. Yeah. Which turned me into a, an accidental sync agent, which I'm not, and I don't like the job, but I'm doing it and starting to farm team up to some other sync agents to handle some of this stuff because it's a job I didn't want to take on. But creating the catalogs were definitely something I wanted to take on. and. And even that's not always for the money. It's for the opportunity to break an artist because three million people Shazam them in the same 24-hour period. That's so powerful, and it happens all the time that someone car insurance commercial goes by, and it's really heavy for a week, and 15 million people Shazam it. Well, that artist now has a platform to break who didn't have a platform the, the month before. So pretty amazing. When I first met Bob and we started talking about me doing some podcasts with him, I said, granted, I'm, you know, the designated geek here, the investment, the financial advisor guy, but I'm going to talk music in every podcast a little bit. Because, you know, we haven't done enough of that today. Right. <laughs> but we're going to get fine. I always ask my guests, what are you listening to uh, personally? And, you know, Bob and I went to see Dream Theater last night. That's probably part of the reason we're somewhat incoherent today, or at least I am. Part of hearing at the very least. So just what are you personally listening to lately? Keep in mind, I know the answer to some of these already, but I think. But Personally, you know what? If I'm working on a pop record or an alternative record, that's what I'm listening to so I can be in the artist world. So a lot of my listening is um, investigative and R&D. So very little time just for pop a cool one and sit back and listen to so-and-so. It just doesn't happen anymore. But w when I do, I go back to some of my top 10 classics um, that, you, that, you, uh, that can't be replaced. The Ziggy Stardust record, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road album, Elton John. I do like current things. I like Eric Church for country. I like a girl named Lily May who was on... Um, Jack White's label a couple of years ago, one of the best traditional country voices in Nashville. UFO, the live album is a staple on my phone. Best live rock album ever in my Just opinion. Just knuckle dragon, rock and roll, make no excuses, sue me, that yep. kind of record. <laughs> you know, uh, Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, All Things by Rush, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, 
I'm digging this kid from Mississippi called Kingfish. I listen to Sean Lane about once a week without fail. I loved um, Willie Nelson sings Christofferson. I bought that record about four different times in all formats, and uh, I wore it out. So I'm, I'm kind of all over the place. We've talked a lot about Rush and UFO and stuff like that, but you know, in terms of me being not quite as all over the place, but you know, I have a pretty diverse taste, and I just bought the new Tears for Fears record, oh, and it's yeah. fantastic. I saw that they had one out. It's the first one in like 17 years, and it's the guy said it's perfect. It's like the old 70s and 80s record. It's 42 minutes long, and it's a concept album, play it cover to cover. And I was telling Bob, I think last night, I really enjoyed it, and I think I know what it's about, but I'm not sure, but that's the beauty of it. Before videos came out, you figured it out on your own. You oh. gotta listen to it a few more times, and then you might figure it out. That was a great time for music and bands like that. Really, you know, the MTV and the hexagon-shaped drums and all that stuff, it was really interesting. It wasn't like a guitar time, but for grooves and different kinds of melodies, it worked for me just as a, a, a live wound for music. I just Everything kind of affects me. I've revisited that era a little bit. I've been listening to Echo and the Bunnymen a little bit, <laughs> believe it or not. And uh, I like Talk Talk for the synth stuff. Right. Now, I yeah. still, you know, I've withdrawn. I got to hit Van Halen fair warning as well. That's you right. Know, sometimes the same evening. But <laughs> anyway, Bob, other than Dream Theater. Uh, I, I'm consistently at least once a week, Pat Metheny group. Oh, especially the good. old stuff from the mid to late 80s. Just Lyle Mays on keyboards. I, I don't think there's anybody that's ever surpassed him as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, Dream Theater. I mean, that was that was a bucket list. You know, I could check off last night was when John and I went and saw Dream Theater. Great, great two-hour show with nine songs. Yeah, thirty-minute encore. It, it was One amazing. Song. Yeah, yeah it's good. Um, <laughs> you know, and then maybe I'm old school. Grand Funk Railroad. Any of their stuff I'd listen to. The old Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Love the old, yeah, the early days of Blood, Sweat, and Tears. David Clayton Thomas right. and Al Cooper and all those guys. And yeah, anything with horns. Tower of Power. You know, right. what is hip? I get in the car, I put that thing on, I bet I've listened to it 500 times, and I crank it up every single time. That's something. Anything's got funk. Sly and the Family Stone, I'm starting to get oh, back yeah. into. That's good stuff. Yeah. I go through periods, and now it's hard for me to know who I'm listening to because I do it on the fly and on mobile. And even when I'm in my studio and I'm listening to something on Spotify, I'll see other artists on their page, and I'm just like, squirrel. So I, I go over to listen to that artist. So I, I never intimately, I think the last records that I bought that I just knew were uh, Linkin Park records, which would be about the time of, it was a little before Imagine Dragons in One Republic, which I went through all of that, Annie Lennox. But those were the kind of the last records I bought that I actually listened to in a way that I would listen to a whole record. But everything else now, it's just uh, one shots in yeah. and out. I think with me, probably the one record I have to listen to cover to cover would be Jeff Beck's Blow by Blow. One of the most well-produced records, and just I love how they, you know, it was uh, George Martin, I think, produced that, and how he just blended one song into the next one as, as one body of work. And But oh, what an amazing album. And I do YouTube constantly. I mean, I've gotten to where I've heard them, I've heard these records, but now watching them play the records or even watching a lyric video, any way just to see the music go by, it's it's been real enjoyable. And you find so many great artists on YouTube that I, I found a guy by the name of El Segalo that I had not heard of before. I was actually searching for another Latin artist and I came across this guy by accident and I went, oh. This is, that's great. Yeah. See, that's discovery. Yeah. And we haven't gotten to discover like that for a long time, people in our our class, our graduating class. So yeah. I love doing it now. Well, my last story for this podcast, and since you mentioned discoveries, sometimes I'll accidentally you find good songs. And I'm driving somewhere back in my hometown of Charleston, West Virginia, and I'm getting on Interstate 64 and listening to the classic rock station there. From noon to one o'clock, they play uh, new songs and requests and things like that, Tip, not typical of the normal catalog. And a song came on, and there was a bass line and this real airy voice. And this was before cell phones and everything. So I pulled over, and I called the radio station. And I said, what was that last song? And it was by a band called Interpol. And it was a song called Evil. And 
I've been a big Interpol fan since then. I guess that's what you would call alternative music. Right. And uh, I like the the, the 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 songwriting style. Reminds me a little bit of the way Walter Becker and Fagan write, the way they tie in choruses and things like that. So I accidentally trip over things like that. You guys are in the business. You know what you're doing. I think you have a more educated ear, but I just know if I like something, I'll damn near cause a wreck on the interstate to find out yeah, who it is, which good. is not a good thing, yeah. probably. But. You're definitely an audiophile. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Thanks so much. You bet. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Trey. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Buson.